sure. Sure thing. You know who funds the Helix Center? What's there? People who do Jungian psychoanalysis, I think. Really? This Friday, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm the new session director of the center. And uh, uh, before I mention today's round table, we are going to start a series on the census that will begin in March and go through May. And it will be five different sessions, one of them on each sense that uh, the associate director, uh, Jerry Horowitz, has uh, taken charge of and is organizing it. Um, today's uh, round table was, uh, the idea was proposed to us by uh, John Williams, who is a professor, associate professor of English, film, and media at Yale University and uh, whose book, uh, Art, Technology, and the Meeting of East and West, was published by Yale University Press in 2014. Uh, he will take over and introduce the other participants. Thank you. OK, thank you, Ed. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, as Ed said, my name is John Williams, and I'm here as the organizer of this conversation on the effects of media. I'm very excited about the five participants we have today, and I will introduce them, after which I'll um, ask a, a few preliminary questions, say a few things, and then get the conversation started. I hope that everyone can hear. Okay, we're doing our best. All right. So first off, we have Daniel Zittrum, who is an emeritus professor of history on uh, on the Ford Foundation at Mount Holyoke College, where he taught for 41 years. He's the author, most recently, of New York Exposed, the Gilded Age police scandal that launched the progressive era. Zittrum's previous books, uh, Rediscovering Jacob Rees, Exposure Journalism and Photography in the Turn of the Century New York, uh, was published by New Press, uh, co-authored with Bonnie Yokelson. Um, offering a fresh look at the progressive era, social reformer, journalist, and pioneer photographer who publicized the conditions of the desperately poor in New York. Uh, Zittram is also the author of, and very relevant to our conversation today, Media and the American Mind from Morse to McLuhan, published by the University of North Carolina Press in 1982. Uh, still in print today, which received the History of the American People uh, Award. Now, he's also the co-author of many other things and has appeared in so many um, documentaries and panels that I'll, I'll just refer you to the rest of his biography, but we're very excited to have him today. Uh, Paula McDowell is professor of English at New York University. She is the author of books and essays addressing media effects from the 18th century to today, including The Women of Grub Street, Press, Politics, and Gender in, London, in the London Literary Marketplace, as well as the invention of the oral, print, commerce, and fugitive voices in 18th century Britain, which won the John Ben Snow Prize of the North American Conference on British Studies. Uh, known for her groundbreaking archival research, her latest project is another archives-based book titled McLuhan's Women. This will be the first ever focused study on the women historians, literary scholars, educators, editors, urban planners, anthropologists, family members, nuns, students and staff members, and others who profoundly shaped this influential Canadian philosopher that we will discuss as well today. Um, Erica Robles Anderson is an associate professor of media, culture, and communication at NYU, the recipient of the 2023-2004 Lenore Annenberg and Wallace Annenberg Foundation, our fellowship in communication at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford, and the editor-in-chief of Public Culture. Her research focuses on the role media technologies play in the production of space. In particular, she concentrates on the configurations that enable a sense of public, collective, or shared experience, especially through the structuring of visibility and gaze. 
trained as both an experimental psychologist and a cultural historian. She has, she has employed a range of methodologies to explore the definition of media space. She's currently writing a book about the 20th century transformation of Protestant worship space into a highly mediated, spectacular megachurch under contract with Yale University Press. Uh, prior to her position at NYU, she was a research fellow in new media and architecture in joint affiliation with the Department of Culture and Media at the Humanities and Technology Laboratory um, in Sweden. Anna Schekman, our last but not least, is a Klarman Fellow at Cornell University and will begin as an assistant professor in the departments or the Department of Literatures in English in 2024. She is writing a two-volume history of the media and data concepts in the United States. The first book builds on her dissertation, The Media Concept, a genealogy, which demonstrates that the imperial spread of the media concept has imperiled the very values it was initially employed to defend. The second, data, a humanistic inquiry, challenges the notion that data has always been the proprietary domain of social scientists. Her first book to uh, be published, which is just coming out, I think, in two weeks, called The Riddles of the Sphinx, is about a history of the crossword puzzle and the sexual politics of wordplay, and will be published by Harper One uh, very soon. Her freelance essays and reviews have appeared in Art Forum, The New Inquiry, The New Yorker, The New York Review of Books, Slate, the Yale Review, and the Los Angeles Review of Books, where she is an editor at large. So please welcome all of our conversationalists today. And to get us started, I would just say, um, as you may have noticed in the initial um, side for our conversation today, 60 years ago, saw the publication of Marshall McLuhan's landmark text, Understanding Media, The Extensions of Man which argued that what mattered about media was that they have certain effects on us above and beyond the content they communicate. Ever since, the question of the effects of media has dominated discussions in everything from communication studies to literature studies, from book history to electronic and digital computation. Today, we bring together a group of people who have devoted a great deal of time and energy thinking within and across these disciplines. We will allow the conversation to evolve organically, but to get us started, I wonder if we might begin to address the question of whether it makes sense today to continue to think about of the media as having effects in these terms, and what those effects are or will become in an era that McLuhan could have only dreamed of, where we scroll and stream and communicate with artificial intelligence. So I throw this to the group to get us started. It's a nice slow pitch. Yeah. <laughs> That's sort of the question. Well, I, I would, I would uh, uh, hazard to, to start off by saying this, that <clears throat> I don't think that the idea of media effects or effects research begins with McLuhan. In fact, um, when I uh, was writing my book, you know, over 40 years ago now, um, what was striking to me was the dominance of the uh, sort of behavioral social scientific approach to studying media. That is to say, what are the effects of media in terms of, of people's behavior? Uh, consumers, uh, voters, and so on. And it was actually my desire to get out of that, that sort of bag, to get out of that, that uh, what I thought was a very narrow perspective uh, that pushed me to do Media in the American Mind. Um, McLuhan's discussion of effects uh, seems to me uh, is, was different. Uh, it's not just about measuring audiences and the impact of your Super Bowl advertisements and so on. Um, it was more about uh, the impact on the sensorium, on, mm -hmm. on, on the human senses. So it was much mm -hmm. broader in that respect. Um, but effects research, quote unquote, uh, was the dominant model for many, many years. And McLuhan is one of the people, I think, that, that steered uh, the study of communication and media away from that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'll just start with that. <clears throat> um. I have a feeling I'm the, the historian here in one way in that most of my work has actually been in 17th and 18th century Britain. So I'm coming at these questions with a very different understanding of, of media, a very, very capacious understanding of media before, long before the kinds of media that I think most of you here today are thinking in terms of 
um, you know, pre-print, e even pre-writing. Um, some of my work has been on the oral and gesture. But in terms of thinking about effects, uh, for me, McLuhan is, is so profoundly late in the game. Um, what interests me most is where he's getting his ideas. But mm -hmm. I'm sure if, if I don't say it, John will say it, the first person to that we know of to talk about media effects is Plato, right? Uh, Socrates telling the story of, of um, Thuth introducing this marvelous invention of writing to King Thamus, and Thamus saying, what you've got here is, in fact, a, a destroyer of, of memory. Um, so, you know, I think one of the big questions alongside effects is how, does, how do each of us here today define media differently. Um, so wonderful, huge question. So one of the really interesting things about McLuhan, given he's sort of, you know, hits, he comes to the United States for a year in like 67, spends a year at Fordham, does a bunch of lectures, but they're, they're very interesting and they're all on YouTube. Um, and then thinking about him today is that there's sort of two things I think about these days in terms of media effects. One is that there's a big New York story to tell that has something to do with the yes. city and that mm. we haven't yeah. done enough to tell yeah. that story. I know little pieces, not very much, but it feels like an opportunity to have a conversation mm -hmm. about what his vision of effects was, given the kind of sensorium that we know is part of urban life here. Um, and why it caught on here, right? Maybe to just kind of think those things together would be really fun to do, and I think about that more and more. And the other piece I think about is something like, in hindsight, thinking of McLuhan, we have the benefit of seeing work that wasn't published in the time when most McLuhan interpreters were working. So we have his dissertation, mm -hmm. for example, that doesn't, isn't published till 2006, and it's all about Elizabethan England, right? And rhetoric and the trivium. And so it's grammar and logic and dialectic, you know, and, and all of these things which seem so far to the side of positivist traditions of causality mm -hmm. and modern science. It's a kind of very Catholic vision um, and a broader kind of you know, sensibility for humanitas that is a non-linear causality. And so when he's talking about effects, it's a different kind of efficaciousness. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be nice to go back and think about some of the metaphysics or the underlying assumptions about what it is to look at the world as if everything is mediated mm -hmm. and how that might have made the view very different than these kind of thin, narrow channels that I think we've we've tightened too much today. And maybe in New York, given how intense this place is, we're actually really well equipped to think about the cutting edge of AI, et cetera. Hmm? Yeah, I'm, I'm tempted to try to connect what Daniel said about the effects school to this idea of New Yorkness, because um, that school really took root or flourished at Columbia during and after the war, um, in large part because so many uh, German emigres from Frankfurt and mm -hmm. um, largely Frankfurt came to the US and were uh, very generatively taking certain European ideas about sort of crowd psychology and um, the mass effects of media, or what would have been called the communications of mass media or mass media communications at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and they, but they were sort of also thriving on this behavioral science movement in, in, in the US. Um, and so the kind of collision of a, of a critique tradition coming from from Frankfurt emerging right. with or merging with this uh, behavioralist mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. phenomenon mm -hmm. is also weirdly a New York story as well right. because it's a kind of um, Ellis Island story. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, th that's embodied in the personal relationship between Paul Lazarsfeld and T.W. Adorno. Right. Adorno's first job in New York was at the Bureau of Applied Social Research that Lazarsfeld led at Columbia, and That's of course- why the, authoritarian, the authoritarian personality is a yeah. weirdly social <clears throat> scientific text. But, but the historian in me has to also um, suggest that, I hadn't thought really about the New York connection that you were making, um, but um, you know, New York City has always been the center of uh, communications in this country ever since the beginning of the publishing industry. Mm -hmm. Um, in the early 19th century, and also the penny press, which also was born in the United States, as well as the Associated Press, uh, which was a sort of monopoly of news gathering, 
and then of course through uh, the early motion picture industry, which was born in New York City, uh, and then the emergence of the broadcasting industries. Um, and the fact that there was so much money available um, for research is directly connected to the fact that um, broadcasters in particular had a problem that previous media folks did not have. I mean, if you have a movie theater, you know how many seats you have and how many tickets you sold. If you have a newspaper, you know what the circulation is. Um, if you have a radio station or radio network, you really don't know who's out there listening and what effect uh, your, your uh, uh, shows or your advertisements are having. Um, and so one of the things that happens is that uh, starting in the 30s, I would argue, you have the growth of, of what you might call demographic science, that is the, the, the attempt to um, sort of reduce human beings to these demographic characteristics uh, mm -hmm. and the development of these sophisticated polling techniques, um, you know, the, the, the Hooper ratings and the Nielsen ratings, um, which also have an impact on politics, I should add. In other words, um, trying to measure the impact of, say, advertisements on people's behavior, what they buy, how they vote, Mm -hmm. um, it, it was really an important um, sort of engine that was driving the, you know, the, the growth of this behavioral um, social scientific approach to, to understanding media, mm -hmm. uh, pre-McLuhan, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the city is where the industries are growing and also where the efforts to figure out the impact of, the, of those industries uh, is mm -hmm. happening as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like we've, we've got like a, we've got a story to tell about some media effects mm -hmm. being something New York should lay a little more claim to, right? <laughs> like, I think we don't have enough hometown pride, actually, about this topic. <laughs> no, you know? I, I, I was once, my, I have a book project I'm working on now that is about the, the media concept and how it came to inform different culture industries around mid-century. Um, and I was, I was told by someone that it's to a cell of corridor. Right, but it's not, it's a little provincialized, but I am focusing on media industries, and so there's a certain um, inevitableness that it would focus in New York and then increasingly Los Angeles. Well, what's the first modern use of the term media? I mean, this is something I try to address in, in my book because it's still a very, very ambiguous term that people use in all kinds of different mm -hmm. ways. Mm -hmm. but the first use that I found of the term media uh, comes in advertising journals, yeah. which are talking about billboards, advertising media, um, but today, in sort of you know common discourse or, or whatever, people use the term media still in wildly different ways. Some people use the term media to describe investigative journalism. Some people use it to differentiate print from non-print. Um, you know, and, and in my view, this reflects some of the, the, the tensions, the historical tensions, what I call dialectical tensions, in media history itself. Um, and, uh, you know, we still don't have a, 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 word, a, a, a common agreement on what the term means. I don't know that we'll get one here today, <laughs> yeah, but probably it's not. complicated. So. I, there's actually a great film starring Jimmy Stewart that not a lot of people have seen called Magic Town. Oh, yeah. Where he plays a, one of these pollsters whose job it is to determine how the country's going to vote one way or the other. And he discovers, I don't know, somewhere in the Midwest, a town that is the perfect microcosmic representation of the entire United States. Whatever this town thinks, he can reliably predict the entire nation will think. And so he goes there, sets up shop, but there's this scrappy, beautiful reporter who wants to modernize the town. They fall in love, and she's trying to change the town. He's trying to keep it the same way it is in order to, to use it as a, as a way of determining the sociological picture of the entire nation. Um, that's one way of thinking about effects, the sort of sociological study of how people behave, what they consume, how they think about, um, what, how they vote. The, the McLuhanian is also a little bit more theoretical in the sense that he, he did this focus on the sensorium, as we were just saying. Mm -hmm. Like for him, the idea that we experience the world constantly with all five senses in a particular ratio of them has effects on us that we're not even aware of, right? We might be receiving more data visually than, than through our ears, and that has an effect on us. Or if we, have, if we feel things more than we see or hear, then that has an effect on us as well. So there's this, and I love that we're actually doing this conversation in, you know, just before the different five Perfect. senses conversation at the Helix Center. But I wonder if um, there's something to that sensorium of what it means to live in a city like New York, like part of what I think creates a, 
a discipline like media studies is the sense that we're being bombarded in all directions by a mediascape, by the fact that we're, we're so constantly immersed in information now, much more so than human beings would have been <laughs> in oral times. I, I can, I think, I mean, just I wanted to go back to something, uh, just to flag it mm. for now, mm. something Erica said about the way we think about absolutely everything is mediated now, mm. just to put that on a to-do list for discussion. Mm. Um, I also wanted to come back to, I completely agree that in terms of McLuhan, uh, the year he spent in New York has been profoundly understudied, and is, there's a lot of potential there. But the proud Canadian in me wants to also, you know, remind us all that he is understood now as being, you know, part of the Toronto School, um, and that if you look at who he flags in the introductions to his book, it's Harold Innes, you know, the the political economist who is tracking the movement of trees in Canada as natural resources and thereby paper and thereby uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then also Albert Lord, the theorist of oral culture. Um, you uh, know, Eric Havelock too? Eric Havelock, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, he's a, a little bit less effusive about Havelock than he is about Lord. But um, so there's that, that whole aspect too. Um, but then coming back to the question of how how moderns, well, you asked what was the first mention of media, the first use of the media concept, or not, you, you didn't say, you said the term medium mm -hmm. uh, in modern times, and I immediately thought, well, okay, modern, that's Francis Bacon in the 17th century, um, <laughs> who isn't using uh, media so much as medium, but, you know, 17th century philosophers were writing specifically about how mediums functioned. Uh, you know, instead of sound being a medium, it's, it's air that's the medium that connects the object and the organ, et cetera. Um, so to, to sort of catapult from this, the early modern period when there all, is all this thinking about connections and mediation and the senses to now is yeah. an interesting move. Well, th there was a great phrase that I found in uh, 1933, um, <clears throat> 1932, 33, President Hoover <clears throat> had... Um, pointed a commission to look at, at various aspects of industrial life. And the discussion in the media, they, they talked about the media of, they, they talked about them as agencies of mass impression, hmm. which is, I think, a great phrase. And that's what I think people were concerned about. What will be the impact of these agencies of mass impression, whether we're talking about radio, yeah. uh, you know, newspapers, or, or what have you. And that, I think, is different than, mm -hmm. you know, Francis Bacon and those folks. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I think that part of what I was trying to get at in terms of the word media was the way to which today it is still sort of tossed around in ways that people don't really agree on, mm -hmm. including, uh, and we're, we're all familiar with this, I think, the blaming of almost every ill in modern life on the media, mm -hmm. right? I mean, nobody knows what that really means, but we use it all the time. Uh, and so there is a kind of, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, imprecision about the term mm -hmm. that, as I said before, I think suggests um, some of the, the contradictions in media history. Um, mm -hmm. I'll stop there. Just about <laughs> 10 different directions I would like to go, and so I guess a, a minute I should just quickly choose one. Um, I, so I think maybe in between mass impression and this question of sensorium is a is the idea of ideology, which is strangely mm -hmm. doesn't come up very often in, in McLuhan, despite the fact that The Mechanical Bride was, you could say, like a work of ideology critique. Yeah. Um, and so I, I guess I'll leave it as a, as a sort of open question. Um, you know, the effect school has gotten sort of flack for being um, naive to ideology and to the ideological effects of media, um, in part because there's a construction of... A, the notion of limited media effects, the limited effects theory, sometimes called two-step flow, was this idea that Paul Lazarsfeld and Merton and Clapper, all of these communication theorists developed in part to sort of say, here in the US, we're not actually that worried about uh, mass media as a kind of totalitarian agent or even the media as a kind of menacing hegemonic force. Um, because based on our social scientific research, 
whether you watch a television show or listen to the radio, ultimately your, your opinions are still going to be informed by face-to-face -face communication with your neighbors or by leaders in your community. Mm -hmm. It's really reaffirming a notion of a kind of um, town square Jeffersonian model of American communications. And that was like a great relief to everyone, I think, and probably a relief to those scholars who could then sort of sell their research to TV stations and uh, feel like they were still participating in a, in a sort of local American mm -hmm. project um, mm -hmm. and not have to worry too much about mm -hmm. totalitarianism. Um, now they've, I think, really justly, that the whole school has really justly been um, criticized for not, for having this very limited notion of media that, that ignores I, I, the sort of, as you were saying, kind of dialectical tension or the sort of recursive quality of media that it, it is necessarily shaping those very norms that apparently face-to-face -face conversation is reinforcing. Mm -hmm. um, now where the question of like, I mean McLuhan's so cool and weird in part because like where on earth does the, does the idea of sensorium enter into any of that, right? On the one hand, mm -hmm. when we're talking about face-to-face -face communication, reinforcing or being shaped by uh, mass media of communications, it would be, I think, easy enough to, uh, to ignore the human body in a way, um, to think about uh, the construction of ideas as kind of abstracted from, from an embodied experience. And so mm -hmm. I guess there's two parts to this mm -hmm. question, which I assure you it actually is. Um, which is sort of what is the relationship between ideology and sensorium in McLuhan's work itself? Um, and kind of how does McLuhan operate as an ideological agent, um, both as a, a thinker and as a sort of salesman of, of the media concept? Mm. Well, maybe we could pull it forward a little bit to kind of think, think about yeah. that question of the sensorium and ideology in McLuhan um, towards the like another bit we all know in the room, right? So 60s New York, he's here, and then media studies starts taking off as a discipline, slowly 70s, 80s, 90s, and then it kind of balloons around the internet coming this way. Yeah. 70s New York is like kind of captured as a really bleak time. I mean, I don't know, I'll admit, I, I'm a 1980 child, so I, I, I only know it cinematographically, but dang, right? It's a Graffiti on the subway, it's the midnight cowboy. It's like everything you know about gritty New York taxi is happening in the same taxi driver, yeah, <laughs> in the same moment. It's the, the turn to austerity, right? And the, the worst kind of. worst economic crisis in the city's history. Right, yeah. right. So we know there has to be something that's shocking to the sensorium right at the moment that this concept, though mm -hmm. New York's been a media capital for a long time, is like there's a crucible of some kind. And I don't exactly know what, what makes the stew catalyze, but I think it's worth thinking about, given we've also been a place for global financial crises, et cetera, et cetera, like what are these pushes and pulls of constriction and austerity doing to the sensorium that simultaneously animates this like Cambrian explosion of experiments with different mediations? Like what is that wish or anxiety? Is there something that we might want to say about it? I mean, I, these are truly questions I have no idea, but I've always wanted to ask. <laughs> One of the ideas that came up with uh, John's comment about Magic City is that uh, the Jimmy Stewart character wanted the place to be the way it is mm -hmm. and representative, mm -hmm. and yet someone else, this the, I don't know if she's a femme fatale, but anyway, the, the, no, the woman the in the newspaper the, reporter, yeah. the newspaper reporter is... Um, wants to advance, wants to advance, progress. And it makes me think of this phrase like, could you please sit still? Like, sit still, would you? Because the idea of this is the way it is. Right. But no, look another minute later, and it's not the way it is. Mm -hmm. right? And I think that may be always a part of what's going on, especially when there's an explosion of the sort you just referenced. Well, two quick things to think about it, try to follow up on these points. Um, one is that I'm glad you mentioned Harold Innes, because uh, Innes, in many ways, was a much more profound uh, <coughs> thinker than McLuhan. And um, Innes was an economic historian who made his reputation with the so-called staples thesis of Canadian history. That is, he argued that you could understand the creation of the Canadian nation by looking at a series of staples products that came to define the Canadian economy. So there was the fur trade, there was um, the fisheries, 
and there was the, the wood and, and lumber trade. And he wrote interesting histories of all these things. Mm -hmm. But toward the end of his, his career and his life, he began looking at changes in communication, modes of communication as being a key way to understand historical change. Mm -hmm. And he talked mm -hmm. about what he called the bias of communication. That is mm -hmm. to say, some communication forms were biased toward time, that is to say, uh, things like uh, papyrus and uh, stone tablets and so on, which uh, lasted a long time. And then there were forms of media, forms of communication uh, that had the space bias. They were portable. They were easily uh, spread around, and they were connected to the, the spread of empire. So writing, paper, um, and, and later on other, uh, other uh, examples. But the, the larger point of this, it seems to me, is that he was most interested in the impact of changing forms of communication on the economies uh, of nations, on, on uh, political economy, uh, on, you know, sort of on structures of, of, of societies. Whereas McLuhan is much more interested in the questions of psychology, the sensorium, mm -hmm. uh, and frankly, things that are much more difficult to measure. Uh, and one of the, the just rereading uh, understanding media, uh, you know, sort of, was, I didn't prepare anything, but I did read that, uh, reread McLuhan. Uh, I was struck by sort of the absurdity of some of his claims to the effect that he's in some sense a scientist, right? He claims he's a psychologist, he's a scientist. He says, I'm like Louis Pasteur, you know, uh, telling people that uh, what, what, what's really causing what's happening, bacteria, you can't see. And people didn't want to believe him. And he, he, he puts a lot of emphasis on his own insight, uh, on the insight of artists, particularly mm -hmm. literary artists, right? Um, and it, it's almost like a trick of vision. Either you see it or you don't see it. Uh, it's not a question of proving anything. He's not trying to, to, to uh, really make it a, a coherent, logical argument so much as he is presenting you with his insights, mm -hmm. um, some of which are, are, I think, still uh, relevant, some of which are, are, are quite insightful. Mm -hmm. uh, but the idea of McLuhan as some kind of a, a scientific figure, um, somebody who is, 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 you know, it, 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 it seems to me is, is fairly absurd. Mm -hmm. um, and i curious, though, also about this question of McLuhan in New York. Mm -hmm. Since Understanding Media came out in 64, um, and I've always thought of his later work as being not as interesting as not as insightful as Understanding Media, the Gutenberg Galaxy, Mechanical Bride, which is his first book. Um, so I wonder if you'd talk a little bit more about that, Eric, about the New York connection. The first three books are definitely the best, no question. Yeah. And then he comes here. I think, yeah. I mean, not to cast shade on Toronto, but I think <laughs> he might have been trying to leave, right? And then something doesn't work out, and he goes back, and he teaches at Toronto for the rest of his time. Yeah. Um, and he is in a, put in a little coach house that's been renovated behind the Medieval Studies Center. There's never a doctoral program, right? I mean, we all know <laughs> in tenured academia life, sometimes you end up in places that don't always love you back. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know what the story is, but I get the feeling that there was something really possible and energizing that fit well, mm -hmm. and that somehow some pieces of that get picked up and sort of transmuted into the direction of Neil Postman will take, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and so something happens there, and there's, I think, a lot of work to do to, to dig that out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you have thoughts well, yet? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I know you. I just wanted to ask you a question. Um, well, returning to that, that I think quite big question you were asking about the 70s New York and why a certain media, like academic media discourse would take root in this particular time. Because I'm, the, the media concept um, really takes off in the middle of the 20th century, so a little bit earlier than that, and, and slightly before McLuhan. I mean, he gets a lot of credit as a popularizer of this discourse, but it's pretty widespread in the, in the late 50s. Um, and I guess... I'm, that's informed a lot, right, by this European crowd psychology, this idea that urbanization and massification, like we're all um, together in spaces and therefore more easily manipulated as a mass. Um, and I, in the image you were painting of New York, I couldn't get the sense if um, there was a kind of isolation and anomie that or something that's informing your, your notion of, or your sense of why a certain study of the sensorium would really take off here, or media effects as, ha as happening on the body would take off here because people are so isolated from each other or because they're so massed together. And of course, one of the, one of, I think you can just say, effects of mass media is that um, one can be a mass in isolation, right? So, um, 
but I wonder if there's something particular about the 70s that, um, that reinforces that mass and isolation -ness? Like, but what? Well, I'll tell you what I really think. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think Don't we, hold that. Oh, it's only on the internet. Um, I think that story of Anna Me is bunk in a lot of ways, yeah. right? And it's, but it's, it's so, it on-ramps the study of communication yeah, so deeply that now we have to go back and do that trick like where, you know, there's like the full table of things and someone rips out the tablecloth of modernity, yeah. right, in the mind shaft and then hopes everything is mostly standing, <laughs> right? right? Yeah. And so we have this big job, which is to go back and tell the story the other way, which is fully from the middle, mediation all the way up and down, um, meso-level analyses, overlapping partial causalities, and and we got to figure out if we can let that modernity story go and what kind of sort of generative social research comes out of that. Because I think this is thinking from the middle is a very powerful way to get rid of thinking of the individual or the macro level totality. And we've just neglected it, I mean, wildly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Paul. There's one other thing that we haven't sort of got on the table here that we need to get on the table if we're talking at all about McLuhan, and that is the fact that he spent his entire career uh, as a literature scholar yes. and, a, and a specialist in poetry. Yes. Mm -hmm. And over and over and over again, he says the, the art, artists are the antenna of the race. Right. You know, he's, he's mm -hmm. quoting or echoing as Pound there. Um, and, you know, I think we, because so many of the easy allusions and references he makes to literary texts like Alexander Pope's Dunciad or Jonathan Swift's Tale of a Tub or King Lear, Endless Shakespeare or Blake. I mean, look at the role of Blake in McLuhan's thinking. Poe. Poe, exactly. The vortex narrative. Joyce. Joyce, uh, it, you know, it goes on and on. Um, and his 6,000 surviving books from his library now at the U of T testify to the incredible amount of time he spent annotating these literary texts, which I think he used as a source material to understand history. Mm -hmm. um, so what does it mean? You know, we may look at uh, understanding media and say, okay, well, here he's referring to um, science of reading studies in the 1950s or what have you, or see him behaving like a scientist, but I don't think he's um, thinking of things as separated like that. Mm -hmm. You know, for him, you can learn as much about how the body operates and what it means to move from an oral culture to a visual culture by reading literary texts and hearing how poets and artists and so forth understood shifts in the human sensorium. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, that's not directly connected to 1970s New York, but we would want to pay a lot of attention to the way these shifts, according to his theory, would have been registered first in art. 100%. Yeah, I, I think it's worth noting as well that he's a literature professor, but the most famous literature professor of the 20th century. Yes. He was in Annie Hall, the Woody yep. Allen film. He yep. made numerous appearances <laughs> on television. He's publishing mass market paperbacks that are avant-garde design. Very the much. medium is the massage, you remember. Yeah. Um, and part of that's because he had uh, an entire advertising agency known as Generalist Inc. run by a very famous ad guy named Howard Gossage yeah. on Madison Avenue who was like very interested in yep. promoting McLuhan's idea, promoting him as a thinker and feeling like there's, there's something to be said there. I, I think one of his most, I think, valuable ideas is precisely this question of him entering the media, of entering the environment of the media, mm -hmm. and talking about artists as having the potential to initiate an anti-environment. Anti yes. So you know the old David Foster Wallace story where yeah. two fishes are swimming along, mm -hmm. and they pass by this older fish who says, good morning, boys, how's the water? And the two younger <laughs> fish swim along, and one of them turns to the other and says, what the hell is water? Yeah. <laughs> and, it's the, and McLuhan loved that idea, because yeah. the idea is that if you get pulled out of the water, you suddenly recognize the environment you were in in a way that you yes. were, didn't when yeah. you were saturated in it. And so artists have that special ability to generate anti-environments for us, to yes. take things that yeah. feel familiar and transparent and render them strange and unfamiliar mm -hmm. and interesting. Mm -hmm. I think that's, a, I think that's mm -hmm. a great insight, actually. One of his more valuable ideas, I think. <clears throat> the, the Madison Avenue thing's important because um, 
Madison Avenue in the 60s and the 70s <clears throat> loved having this sort of Mandarin literature professor tell everybody how brilliant they were. Yeah. Uh, and McLuhan's own, own connections with Madison Avenue, I think, were important. Also, the, uh, the Do Line newsletter he had, mm -hmm. which um, was heavily subscribed to by corporations and people in the military, too, mm -hmm. um, who saw McLuhan as some kind of uh, avatar of... of uh, you know, I think looking back now, it, to me, it seems clear that, that McLuhan is very much a, a, a product of the 60s, and, and he's... You know, he's responsible, if nothing else, for the tremendous um, sort of uh, development and accelerated development of what I would call media consciousness, right? Mm -hmm. The idea that, that, that media exists, that they have a, you know, so you start having newspapers running columns, media criticism. Uh, you start having uh, uh, a, a much more popular understanding that, that, that the media matter. Um, part of what I was trying to do was go further and say, yes, and they have a history. Uh, because the everywhereness, the never-endingness, the ubiquity of the mass media, um, you know, it, it sort of encouraged this idea that they've always been this way and that they don't have a history and that they're not the product of historical choices, political choices, mm -hmm. economic choices. Um, and one of the problems I've, I have with McLuhan, I've always had, is that he sort of evinces a kind of what I would call technological naturalism. The idea that, 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 that the media are some, uh, in some ways the substitute, or now the, the, the environment is the media. You know, it's no longer, uh, you know, kids running around in the woods or going swimming in the lake. That's not the real environment. The real environment is is television. Uh, and of course now with the cell phones. Did you think that's true though? I mean... Well, there's, there's some truth to it and I, you know, I've been thinking a lot about the subtitle of um, Understanding Media, the extensions of man mm. and man, uh, is the cell phone not the ultimate extension of the body? I mean, everywhere you go, uh, every 13 year old has the entire world in his or her pocket. Uh, and that is a kind of media penetration, a, a new type of media form. In fact, the whole digital aspect of media, which I did not write about, um, you know, is, is post-McLuhan. Uh, and uh, yet it, it does seem to have be relevant in the terms of, of the notion of the extension of the body. I mean, the phone is, you know, 2008, the, the beginning of the smartphone is going to be seen as an important historical marker, in my view, when people mm -hmm. look back. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm rambling. I'll keep quiet here for a while. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's a number of McLuhan's. We've talked about the kind of overdeterminedness of the media concept. There's also an overdeterminedness of the McLuhan concept at some level. Um, you know, we have him as a, as a kind of modernist critic in a way of something like a, um, a inert, inertness to one's surroundings. Um, but I think there's also, you know, we, we also have him as a kind of I don't know, sellout, the iconic academic sellout. Um, but there's also one way of thinking about him is also as a, as a kind of postmodernist thinker as well. I, I, the line in Annie Hall that he says, which is just right. brilliant, I mean, my whole, my whole fallacy is wrong, right? And that my whole fallacy, um, elsewhere in his work, he talks about whole fallacies as being the kind of formation of, of modern thinking that he wants to bump, you know, push back against. That's the sort of, if there's any more postmodern project than that, I don't know what there is. What's so great I'm, is that he, he's like obsessed with this guy called Thomas Nash. Yes. I don't know anything yes. about Thomas yes. Nash. His I'm just kind of, yeah. but I bet Paul does. <laughs> right? I'm the subject of his dissertation. Oh, but it's nothing but Thomas Nash, this guy mm. who's writing these pamphlets in defense of bishops and is doing like this kind of like high like literary references, but low vernacular, leaving these amazing blank spaces in his typography. So you can add your own insults, like a message board, you know, to insult the person to you. And so it's so interesting. It's like he's playing at such a far back past yes. and present. And so it's like, what's going on there with time? And yeah. he, he has a mental repertoire that goes back, you know, to classical literature and the whole history. He sets out to write this thesis on Th Thomas Nash. And, you know, the war is about to break out and he has to do this thing fast. And 
Uh, he sets out to write a thesis on Nash, but he decides that the real fight between Nash and his opponent was all about the transformation of logic, rhetoric, and dialectic, and mm -hmm. that therefore he had to go all the way back to classical times and understand that whole history. And if you look at his dissertation, he doesn't actually get on t to Nash until his last Very, chapter. Yeah. And he has to leave uh, England because the war is breaking out. He basically just puts a period behind it. Mm -hmm. But I think you're so right that, you know, again, um, I feel bad because I keep pushing us back in history, but McLuhan does it for us. Yeah. If we actually look not just at his, you know, understanding media, but at, a, at his total body of writing, most of it is about before the 20th century. Yeah. Um, there's so, one, there's one yeah. continuity that's interesting. Yeah. His dissertation is all about this conflict of the trivium. The yes. three things, rhetoric, yes. grammar, logic. Exactly. The different advocates of those traditions are all fighting throughout medieval times and before. Yeah. And he's arguing for a new ratio in which the grammar is, the grammatica, the magic of, of language is, is heightened in the tradition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then he switches to electronic media, mm -hmm. and he's still talking about the ratio of things, but Very now it's much. the human sensorium, mm -hmm. yeah. and all about how the way that we, that our, our electronic environment is changing the way that we think, the way that we feel, because mm -hmm. of its media, not because of the content of mm -hmm. the media. Yeah. Um, and I want to, I mean, I, I'm nerding out on all of this McLuhan, but I'm also cognizant of our, of our of everyone hearing that maybe um, we could push it a little beyond McLuhan to maybe follow up on something Dan was talking about with contemporary digital objects, which um, it is a kind of question of the ratio. How much of our mm -hmm. lives have we exteriorized into these objects? What's the ratio of the self that now exists mm -hmm. in the phone that we carry with this? What are, what are children... You know, what's, what's it like to be born in a time when mm -hmm. that's... Do you ever think what McLuhan would do with a phrase like tech neck? Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think it's important to remember, again, the historian in me, that, that this is not the first time where there has been a new media form that has really shaken up yeah. uh, the society and the culture. And so one of the things I did in Meeting the American Mind was look at the contemporary responses, the popular responses to new media forms. So starting with the telegraph, which really was the first separation between transportation and communication. Yeah. It's also the first binary system, right? The Morse code, everything's either a dot or a dash. Um, and there's this tremendous utopian outpouring of, uh, uh, of um, you know, excitement over what the telegraph is going to do. And when the first Atlantic cable uh, was completed in 1858, you had, uh, you know, in New York City, you had tens of thousands of people marching in these parades celebrating uh, uh, this, this great thing and a lot of invoking of Christian the spread of Christianity and, and so on and so forth. Uh, with motion pictures, similarly, there's a whole debate around movies that really transforms the notion of what we mean by culture, um, and sort of, you know, essentially it attacks or, or 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 goes beyond the sort of traditional Matthew Arnold sweetness and light culture is something that can only be enjoyed by the wealthy and the educated. Um, radio broadcasting, uh, you know, the importance before the networks come in of the ham operators and all of these people who are fascinated with the possibilities of wireless transmission. Um, and of course, the dialectic I was talking about before that I've seen is that you have this sort of, in, in the emergence of new media, you have this, this dialectic between these sort of utopian, progressive ideals about what the media are going to bring, and then you have the flip side, which of course is the use of media as instruments of domination and exploitation, commercialism, and so on. And I think that dialectic is throughout, um, you can see it throughout media history. Um, certainly the internet, uh, you know, in, in recent years has, has created the same kind of discourse. Uh, all the great things that can and have been done with the internet, uh, but also the sense that um, it's a nightmare, uh, you know, yeah. in, in so many ways. Um, and it so, runs against the secularization thesis that all of these new media are simply taking us into some kind of disenchanted enlightenment where, you right. know, no one has... 
Yeah, and I mean, strange idea. The, the, the thing about McLuhan, and you know, two things about the literary criticism. One is that, of course, he was a, a student and an advocate of the new criticism. And if you think about the idea of the medium as the message, it's not all that different from some of the new critical perspectives that the text is all right. It doesn't matter who the author is, doesn't matter his or her history and all that. But it's really, it's about the text. Um, but also uh, McLuhan's Catholicism. Mm -hmm. um, you can read uh, his theory as a kind of r a new version of Christian myth, right? Mm -hmm. That there is the Eden of oral culture, um, which is destroyed by the fall of the alphabet and print. Uh, but there's going to be a resurrection uh, with oral culture brought in, but the return of oral culture brought in by television and new media. Mm -hmm. um, now that's kind of simplistic, but I do mm -hmm. think there's some truth to that. Um, and that, that behind the scientist and the psychologist and all of that talk about, you know, uh, 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 yeah, he's, he's really in some ways restating a kind of Christian myth as a way of understanding media. Mm -hmm. With a twist. Okay. I, I completely agree. I mean, that's, you know, for McLuhan and with Walter Ong, it's all about cognitive shifts that different media or different senses even affect the way our minds work. Um, so, you know, the ratio of the senses, the hearing, touch, seeing, taste, smell. For McLuhan, he cl clearly thought that print rebalanced the ratio of our senses, that we went from orality, which is this sensory all around surround sound. I can hear what's going on in the back of my head, but I can't see it, to this visual, linear, uh, rationalized form of intaking the world. And here we see his biases towards alphabetic literacy, because not all forms of, of writing, if you will, are, are strictly visual. Um, but when he starts saying, talking in these weird phrases about the orality of the electric age. You know, we're going back to orality and, and it will bring us together in this um, Catholic communion. Uh, you, he also, there's something interesting going on because he's writing in the 20th century and orality for him also means Hitler's radio broadcasts, you know. Um, so there's a real violence to it. Uh, he doesn't. Um, he doesn't idealize. He sees oral communication, oral mouth, face to face, and the new orality, if you will, of of radio and so forth, as having an element of violence. Mm. Uh, and I can't claim to understand that. I mean, I think it's true uh, that you know the voice can evoke violence um, and bombardment of. Uh, but I, I can't quite uh, understand his thinking there. He is very aware of this sort of violence that, you know, from our perspective, we would see magnified a hundred times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this goes back to something Anna was saying about the word mass in front of yes. mass media, which yes. is always invokes something a little bit... Yeah. Um, totalitarian. Totalitarian, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Or thinking religious yeah. Yeah. mass, right? Oh, as well. Yes. <laughs> a lot of that, yes. but yes, as well. Yeah. yeah, that's really mm. good. I mean, I wonder what he would think, uh, given that sort of range of all the good, the bad, and the ugly mm -hmm. um, that come from these shifts about, like, just to kind of, like, now we're on the brink of this AI thing, which we know, like, I think isn't going to go away even if it's snake oil, mm -hmm. because there's so much money invested mm -hmm. at this point mm -hmm. with such huge players. Like Henry Kissinger has a book. So we know, right? There's something that's yeah. going to stick yeah. around for too long. Yeah. So did he I, die? Oh, he did. He still, has a book, he still has that book, though. Um, <laughs> yeah. So there's something about the balance opened up again between the production of print, you know, mm -hmm. and word, and also the capacity to render image or conjure things from rhetoric yes. into, like, and it seems like I would be curious, like, what might, what might be the things that having read so much of him atten make us attuned to, whether it's the sense ratio shifts or the kinds of figures like artists that would give us a clue, or the modes of balancing living in this way, mm -hmm. like, is there something that feels helpful to mm -hmm. frame this moment or to keep an eye out for certain sorts of things? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think it's what he didn't do. Um, I think there is something helpful, but it's um, partly in the critiques that his book undertook or from the very, very beginning. Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking of Raymond Williams' attack on McLuhan's understanding of television, mm -hmm. uh, him saying that he has erased the, the human agents who make choices that yes. make these technologies what they are. Mm -hmm. uh, and this brings us to, um, you know, his huge debt to Elizabeth Eisenstein, the printing press is an agent of change. Again, the criticisms there were uh, accusations, which I personally think are false, that she was a technological determinist, you know, but she doesn't focus on the human agents and their choices so much as the shifts that the technology somehow seems to be bringing in by itself. Mm -hmm. um, so I think human agency is, is something that he didn't always address. Yeah. Um, and, sorry, go ahead. Okay. Oh, I was just going to say the, um, the seductiveness of technological determinism as an explanatory mm -hmm. model is definitely something that I, whether or not he is a technological determinist or not, I think is mm -hmm. something that um, he maybe ran with or his, um, yeah. there was a certain mass appeal to this idea that these new technological agents had in fact changed everything, yeah. right? Um, that's more seductive than ever as an explanation for mm -hmm. modern life when you actually have, um, you know, inventions, innovations that their, their whole raison d'etre is to diminish human agency. Right. That's right. Um, yeah. And so, you know, it's even in the, in the reporting about, about AI and about ChatGPT, you can see the role of human agency being diminished and diminished and diminished. That, that incredible New York Times story about the reporter who, I don't know, engaged with the chat bot and the chat bot tried to convince him to leave his wife and right. she loved him. Yeah, yeah. The, story, yeah. the one thing that was like minimally reported as, it, as the story itself was remediated was that he started out his initial gambit was asking the chat bot to perform the Jungian shallow self. And that's not something that's really often accounted for in that, st in that story. Otherwise, it's just like this sort of cyber techno romance that's also a techno dystopian romance, right? That, what if the chatbot really did want to escape the screen and fall, fall in love with this user, right? That's a great story. It's less great when he's scripted it to, um, or his mode of inscription, his agent as a user is sort of mm -hmm. eliminated from, or yeah. is, is accounted for. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, two quick points. One is that <clears throat> I don't think that, that McLuhan had the same kind of critical perspective, both politically and economically, that Harold Ennis had. Yep. One of the main reasons that Ennis got involved with studying media was because he was concerned about the impact, the growing impact of American cultural imperialism on Canada. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, all the major population senators in Canada were getting American TV, American radio, and American movies, and all the rest, and he was deeply concerned about that. I don't find that mm -hmm. in McLuhan. Um, the, 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 the other point to make, again, an historical one, is that, you know, 1960 was the moment when you had pretty much uh, total penetration of, of um, televisions in American homes. That is, uh, mm -hmm. over 90% of Americans had a TV by 1960. Three years later, 1963, we have network news. Um, 60s is the TV moment, so mm -hmm. to speak, in terms of the, the new dominant medium. Uh, and I think that's part of what's driving McLuhan as well. Mm -hmm. um, no. And the Vietnam War is on TV. Sorry? And the Vietnam War is on TV. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, yeah. Well, and... You know, most famously, he said the medium is the message, which I think is worth mentioning because mm -hmm. that's yeah. <laughs> literally the idea that the, I think he said the medium is so much more powerful than whatever it's communicating that it's like yeah. the writing, the, whatever you stencil on the side of an atomic bomb before you drop it. That's about how much the message yeah. matters. What matters is the technology, the device itself. Yeah. But when you get to something like AI with JetGPT where... It's literally um, the question of agency becomes suddenly different. You mentioned that the, one of the first definitions in the 1930s was agents of mass impression. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. now agency is uh, very much on the table with the question of the words themselves are the medium and the message. Mm -hmm. They become, they're sort of conflated into this single entity now. 
So it's almost like you have to take McLuhan for granted before you can then go on to begin to talk about AI in some way. But we've always needed to teach. I mean, this is where education comes in. It, throughout history, I mean, a lot of the same concerns about women getting access to books in the 18th century or to print, that they will confuse reality and... Uh, and books and <laughs> endless satires on women who are, you know, Don Quixote, even at the very beginning of printing. He's, he's confusing romance with, with reality. And I think, you know, we've always had to teach new readers, new users, how to uh, use these new technologies. And Presumably, it's the same, and I'm sort of going through this with my freshmen right now, the whole question of, of AI, and I just simply sh said, okay, let's, let's let it do a bio of me, and I'll point out how many things in the bio are wrong. Give it uh, a year. Uh, yeah, right, give it a year, and then I actually said that. I said, right now, you know, everything's, yeah, you got it, Anna, well, give it a year. In this respect, it's, it's I think, worth remembering that his first book, uh, 1951, The Mechanical Bride, mm -hmm. which is very different from all the rest of the stuff, as you pointed out, mm -hmm. um, really comes out of his frustration that as a literature professor, the students are not that much interested in or sort of, yeah. you know, not really reading uh, Joyce and Pound and, and all the other modernists, the Yates that he championed. Uh, but he was shocked to see how incredibly astute they were about advertisements mm -hmm. and about what they saw in, in the mass media. And mm -hmm. so he writes Mechanical Bride almost as a way to sort of recapture these mm -hmm. students who we can't get to listen to him in class about, about literature, yeah. but they are interested in all these images of, of mass media. Um, and so that's a kind of a bridge he's, he's trying to, to build. Mm -hmm. um, of course, then he goes off on a whole other tangent. But mm -hmm. uh, Mechanical Bride is still really well worth reading. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot of wonderful stuff in there, but it's very different than the, the later McLuhan in the very, sense that he's really much. trying to do what we would call content analysis. Yeah, uh, I think of, it was of, a really experimental book for him. Yeah. I mean, he was mm -hmm. really struggling trying to feed a family yeah. of six and... Just, you know, basically, if you look at the publishing history, handed the uh, press a box of clippings with his probes beside them, and it was just a nightmare publication. Um, just circling back to the question I had about whether ideology is m more useful or generative than, mm -hmm. than necessarily the sensorium, um, mm -hmm. not that they're inseparable, but, but mm -hmm. sensorium was the one he focused on as opposed yeah. to ideology yeah. when um, you know, a lot of other media, media scholars or early media scholars at the time, that was their real concern. Yeah. Um, to me, when thinking about AI at least, it's really hard to know how one would think about the human sensorium in relationship to AI. I think it'd be a really an in interesting question. Yeah. Whereas ideology is all over the surface. The only way that the predictive algorithm can know what the next word is is what's the what's the average next word, right? One way mm -hmm. of saying that is like, what's the hegemonic next word or something mm -hmm. like that? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know, I mean, that, maybe this is sort of an open question. Is there a usefulness of the sense ratios when thinking about AI? Maybe you already asked that question, but I'd like to put mm -hmm. it back. Mm -hmm. We should always be remediating. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, you know, maybe one of the things that that surfaces, and it's nice to have the hold on ideology here, is that AI's gone off on this sort of assumption that it's intelligence we're talking about, right. and a brain model or a mind model. Mm -hmm. And so we have this invitation to think about what's coming out as if it were like a person or a psyche, yeah. you know, yeah. individual and whole. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if we thought with the sensorium if we could take a door through to another kind of model or metaphor that could then inflect back on what we think technology might That's be useful right. for, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we could come back to something like um, being in the city, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if the things that people are telling me are the best chocolate ever are true or false, right? <laughs> and there's graffiti all over the place and there's overlapping partial understandings. It's, it's a lot, right? Yeah. But I'm not asking questions about, I might be asking if this is felicitous, but I'm not asking if it's true, right? And so is there some other set of models for generativity that there's a clue here we could pursue in order to kind of make an ideological critique about the idea of putting the person and the computer on the same level mm -hmm. and then nice. fold in something about where the agency 
agencies are that hold up that illusion of a dialogue, mm -hmm. but there's like this mm -hmm. teeming mass of social energies mm -hmm. that are really what is the juice in the whole operation, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. One thing about the notion of the sensorium that I don't think you've touched on is that we usually, and this again ties in nicely to our upcoming talks on yeah. the senses, but yeah. we use our sensorium as the basis of our knowledge. Yeah. Right? It's, and we think of things like, we say things like, you know, seeing is believing. It seems to be a direct access, a vertical access to what's real. Mm -hmm. It's not really so. But anyway, that's how we see it. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious about how that fits in with AI and, mm -hmm. and all the rest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we haven't gotten, you know, extended mind theory on the table or, you know, extensions of man. Like, I, I, it's really promising to think of uh, the sensory ratio as a way of reminding us that we are putting the human and the commu computer screen on the same and AI on the same plane in our analysis. At the same time, I could see... McLuhan or maybe some extended mind theorists saying that that's a false, false division, that's, a, that's an illusion, mm -hmm. um, that the human has always been technological and this is si simply another extension of the, of the body or the mind. I don't know. I mean, I'm thinking of how you interact with seeing people much younger than me interact with their phones. It's like almost, it is haptic. It is the speed with which they can operate these things. Mm -hmm. Prosthetic. Um, prosthetic in a way, right? Yeah, you, prosthetic. You, exactly. You. It becomes a prosthetic. There's a great uh, part where um, in Clark and Char Chalmers, who were the guys who first wrote this essay on the extended mind, huh. And one of their colleagues likes to tell them that their essay, which was written in 1996, wasn't true until 2008 when the <laughs> smartphone was invented, uh, and then it yeah. became true. And, it became true. and that we're suddenly now <laughs> genuinely living in an era of extended mind. And um, I think there's also <clears throat> plenty of examples in the popular culture. I'm thinking most uh, uh, saliently about uh, the Terminator, right? The movie the Terminator and the, the various. Uh, which one? Uh, the, the, the various, uh, I'm talking about the, the Schwarzenegger movies, yeah. right? In which one of the basic conceits is that the machines took over, right? That, that what happened mm -hmm. was that, mm -hmm. you know, the, and I think that there's a kind of a fear among a lot of people about AI that's related mm -hmm. to this, that, well, what if these things basically get out of our control and, mm -hmm. and they take over? Um, maybe not the way, you know, they did for Arnold, but, but still, that is the dystopian fear, I think, that, that some people bring to the AI, along with all the, all, all the great possibilities and so on. Yeah, but what if, what if this means the, the end of human agency, so to speak? Um, I'm not saying I believe that, but I think that there's mm -hmm. a lot of that out there um, that's clouding the whole AI discourse. Mm -hmm. Well, and this is the question I, I think I have for Paula, is that I think the, fa the fantasy of, uh, or the theory of extended mind, I wonder how that sits with the fantasy of extended mind divorced from the body, right? The sort of mm -hmm. virtual reality mm -hmm. or meta space, I'm metaverse. Yeah. Um, right, that um, there is a fantasy that in addition to a fully liberated, a subject fully liberated from labor because the chatbots are doing everything for us and maybe mm -hmm. we'll possibly have a universal basic, and this is the open AI guy's idea maybe, right? That we'll be liberated from labor. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also another fantasy, a Zuckerbergian fantasy, right? That we'll be liberated from our bodies. And in that way, mm -hmm. it sort of renders the whole question of um, sensorium and the media effects on the human sensorium moot almost. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, yeah. it's a fantasy, yeah. but... Um, renders them moot because it changes the whole... Understanding of the human, what right, it means human to be is, human. Is uploaded, right? But, yeah. Um, this yeah. Is, this is knowledge ab abstracted from or divorced from the body, which couldn't be more sort right. of antithetical to McLuhan's thought. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it has to be an ideology, as you're saying, because I think, like, this fear, the question is uh, will machines come to control society? Mm -hmm. Like, let's say we rephrase that as will billionaires invent machines that allow them yes. to control society? Well, yes, yes. that's already yeah. happened. So yeah. the difference. Yeah. <laughs> But the difference is because we're positing some kind of agency to the mechanical, to the machine, that in this ideological fantasy allows us to imagine 
our total separation from machines that we that we yeah. are that we become the machines by uploading consciousness into mm -hmm. the machine as though we're not already mm -hmm. deeply enmeshed in machine systems mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. Can I riff on that? I just love that statement. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So I just like that was so generative. Um so I'm wondering what if we rephrased it like fish water, mm -hmm. um, like how will we live given we know there are these billionaires who want to make these machines that control all, you know, yeah. to, to give themselves cover to make all the decisions, right? Like that's the water, you know? And then like maybe right. there's an abiding way of being like, whoa, mm -hmm. whoa, like what's that? Can, is that a media ecology, the, those guys? I love that idea. You know? Yeah. Is that yeah. a mediation in the yes. ideological sense? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good move. Um, and then I'm thinking of John Durham Peters' book, a Philosophy of Elemental Media. What's the, the main? Marvelous, Marvelous Clouds. Marvelous Clouds towards a philosophy of elemental media, where he makes the argument that all these kinds of media we are talking about rest upon the media of air and clouds and ocean and, and so forth. And so... Um, you know, you hit it on the nail, like who is controlling, it's, it, it's the same with any new technology, who is controlling um, the, the forms of mediation. Uh, just one little statistic from the 18th century, I promise, my last one, but, but you know, in 1695, there were 24 legal printers in all of England, hand presses, one press, maybe two presses per shop in all of England. The law of licensing lapsed by accident because there were, you know, the threat of war going on. Within a decade, there were 75 printers, printing houses in, in the London area alone. So that is a huge explosion of people with access to a powerful form of technology and communication that all happened because of one law lapsing. So, you know, it gives me hope that, you know, we, we can at least identify the problems and then maybe you could restate what you just said because it was so good about can we say this is a media ecology when we start to talk about um, the economics, the agency, the law, um, the right? law. The well. which I think is what Diana's <clears throat> pointing at. Yeah. You know? yeah. We put all of our faith in Lena Khan at the moment. That's where my, all, all mine is. Sorry. All of our faith in Lena Khan, the FTC chair. Yeah. She's <laughs> the only person I have any faith in to well, do anything I mean, right now. Another way to talk, think about this is to look at the American Revolution um, and the relationship between the new media of the day and the American Revolution. In other words, mm -hmm. uh, it, Paul Starr has written about this and um, mm -hmm. the creation of the, of the, of, of the mass media. Mm -hmm. um, why is it that America has the First Amendment that protects uh, speech. Uh, why is it that, that America, the first in the American Republic, created a post office that was free? I mean, it's largely free. Um, why was it so important to protect the dissemination, the free dissemination of ideas um, mm -hmm. in the United States? And of course, that has to do with the reality of the American Revolution, the importance of the pamphlet literature, uh, the importance of, new, of colonial newspapers. All these things were, mm -hmm. were seen in a much different light than they were in England mm -hmm. or on the continent. Yeah. Uh, and they were kind of baked in um, to the American system. Um, because in the late 18th century, um, the pamphlets, the newspapers, all of that, that uh, the broadsides, all that stuff was seen as something that had to be protected uh, and that we need, to, we need to make sure that we protect it in this new, uh, this new republic. Yeah. Um, so I think that at any given time, moment, historical moment, when you have new media forms, you have this conflict, uh, often very complicated conflicts over exactly the question of who's going to own it, who's going to control it, who's going to run it. Um, you know, this idea that the media developed the way they did because they had to mm -hmm. is fundamentally false. Um, you know, and, and the example I always like to use is when you look at broadcasting, right? Um, in the UK, when the question of how are we going to pay for broadcast programming came up, the idea was, well, we'll create the BBC mm -hmm. and we'll fund it with a national tax on receivers. Every time you buy a radio, some of the money goes to support the BBC. In the US, radio broadcasting develops in a very, very different way. Mm -hmm. We're going to pay for it through advertising. We're going to sell time 
uh, on broadcasting. Uh, advertisers are going uh, to foot the bill. And so you have two very, very different uh, uh, developments in, in radio broadcasting. There's nothing natural about it. Um, there, there's nothing, uh, uh, you know, determined about it. It's, it's the product of these complicated decisions and different political um, um, and, and economic uh, uh, situations. A really interesting thing happens in the in the seventies in DC, not New York, um, uh, at, around the sort of definition of diversity in FCC uh, regulations, whether or not diversity is meant to be anti-monopolistic in terms of doling out licenses, or whether diversity is meant to pr promote um, sort of ident identity-based diversity. Mm -hmm. um, it, there's I have a friend who talked about this particular period as being the elbow with neoliberalism, and this is a particularly useful moment to think about that because um, among the factors or functions of this switch to um, licenses being uh, relegated or, or, or um, assigned based on uh, identity was also that there was much more corporate conglomeration that could happen as a result. Sure. The role of cable is, is totally involved in there too, but mm -hmm. there's so many factors going into this mm -hmm technological, ideological, um, mm -hmm. definitional, right? What does diversity mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It gets increasingly complex the, with the machines that we interact with now. I mean, there's something, there's a kind of lovely crudeness to defending the broadside and, yeah. and having, you know, 70 presses as opposed yeah. to 20, yeah. when, in fact, now every interaction with your phone is a kind of palimpsest of different ownerships right. and, yeah. and your eyeballs are tracking and they're, you know, the, the split second divisions of your attention are now marketed in, well, in thousands of different ways. It's increasingly nostalgic for the time of just cable packages because I'm spending <laughs> yeah. so much money on yeah, different streaming exactly. devices. Like, well, I think TiVo yeah. was like a sweet spot, actually. There you go. I, I mean, growing up at a time when there was only three television stations, yeah. you know, plus yeah. PBS, yeah. Um, the emergence of cable was seen by many of us as this is a great thing. This is going to, you know, open things up. Right. Of course, it didn't happen the way many of us wanted it to, but, you know, uh, and at the same time, you've got, uh, you know, you think about, uh, if, I would argue that the people that most took advantage, uh, most successfully took advantage of cable and satellite technology were basically uh, evangelical Christians who created a whole sure. network of broadcasting, radio and TV stations, Christian Broadcasting Network, Pat Robertson, all those people, they were, they were brilliant uh, in, in, in seeing that they could do this. Um, but with digital, it seems to me that, that the old distinction between certain people are producers and everybody, we have a democracy of, 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 of reception and an oligarchy of production, right, or broadcasting, now, Potentially, everyone has their own station, right? Everybody has got mm -hmm. can produce their own stuff on on you know YouTube or whatever, uh, on their websites uh, and so on. And now again, I'm not saying that large corporations and and, and big money don't have a, a, a big capital don't have a a, a huge influence, uh, but again, there is that utopian side of this thing uh, that this has opened up all kinds of possibilities that were never there before uh, in old-fashioned broadcasting. That's, I mean, our level of engagement, I think, in some way masks the, the forms of ideological control that are constantly at work. Because just because we're so deeply immersed in it and we feel now like the particular conversations we participate in, the things I subscribe to, the people I belong to as friends on social media, that this is somehow my identity, the profile of me that is in fact an algorithmic profile that companies are, are selling to each other and marketing. And so I think that it actually is still a question of ideological um, force and economic power, and mm -hmm. what it's is just that so much more difficult. That we keep talking about. I've heard this oh, word. Capitalism. I'll go oh, neoliberal. yeah. okay. well, neoliberalism even uh, narrower, uh, right? Well, we no, 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 no. We're, we're just yeah, yeah, talking okay. about uh, capital and the attachment of yeah. different yeah. technologies. Yeah. Ideological yeah. is in the sense that, as we were just saying, that there's um, an environment. And when you're in it, it feels natural and transparent mm -hmm. and like you're yeah. simply a fish swimming in water. There's a fish knows it's in water. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think the reason why using ideology more broadly, especially because I was starting out talking about these um, behavioralist school uh, uh, studies that were <coughs> ostensibly divorced from ideology, was that the implicit, uh, the implicit politics of their research was that 
uh, in the U.S., the effects of media are basically neutral right. because we live in a pluralistic society right. as opposed to in but, a totalitarian society yeah, where yeah, there are anything yeah. but. No, no. Yeah. Good point. And, and of course, the, the famous uh, acronym, you know, uh, that sort of was the bedrock of, of that re behavioral research tradition, who says what to whom with what effect, but didn't bother to ask the question why. Uh, right, uh, and I mean, so, so. Uh, well, and also, how in that situation means a formal technical means, and not like who's footing the bill. Right, but I can recall. I mean, you know, in the '60s and '70s, Congress had endless hearings about the impact of violence on kids or the impact of advertising on children. And the networks and the advertising agencies would have a parade of social scientists that would all say the same thing. Well, you really can't say that there's any direct connection between, you know, advertising or violence on television and the behavior of children. Uh, and at the same time, of course, we know that, uh, you know, when the Super Bowl is on, Corporations are paying $7 million for 30 seconds of advertising. I don't think they'd be doing that if it didn't have some effect. And so, you know, there's that contradiction. Well, you can't really point out the effects, but in terms of the larger uh, capitalist system, mm -hmm. there certainly is. Uh, well, I think that's the danger. The human mind is very, very open to being influenced. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, to use another fish story, uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know who invented it, but there was a story that if you give a child a fish, it eats for a day. If you teach them how to fish, they eat for a lifetime. And we still do have something called public education. And I was at a climate change thing about a week ago, and uh, there was a real sense of urgency in the room, and, and someone asked one of the speakers, what's the single most important thing you think we can do? And the speaker unhesitatingly said, I think there should be a mandatory course on earth systems for every elemental, uh, elementary school child. Um, and, you know, I don't have children in elementary school or, or high school, so I don't know. Are children being required to te take a course on media systems or no. media navigation or media thinking or media critique? No. Um, no, and then one of the, I think, implications or impacts of, of, of all this discussion about media since the 60s and 70s is understanding the difference between schooling and education, mm -hmm. right? I mean, people go to school, but they're educated all the time outside of school by all these things that we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a pure product of public schools, um, I, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the idea that public schools, you know, need to be doing more about this media literacy, whatever we're calling it mm -hmm. these days. Um, but I'm also aware of the fact that, you know, as long as we have a public school system that is uh, funded by local property taxes, um, that's probably not going to happen. Uh, <clears throat> There's this other narrative that we've sort of touched on a little bit relating to the sort of Frankenstein monster narrative, you know, whether or not, I mean, like in Jurassic Park, you know, the billionaires put this park together and, of course, mm. it runs amok. And I wonder how much that may be influencing our dialogue about this. I, um, there's a political science, political theory uh, writer named Hannah Pitkin, who's like a Hannah Arendt scholar, beautiful work, mm -hmm. but she's always taking a rent to task for talking about the social, and she says, it's like a blob. It's just, where is it? Where does it end? What is this thing? And so it's like we've entered a space where like media is a blobby concept, right? Yeah, like it, yeah. like you were saying, like people are the media, it's all the, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. a, it's superstitious almost, right? If it touches you, you might get the media. Yeah. Like, you know, like it's weird. So there's something, and everybody over there is more susceptible to it than me, you know, because they're weaker somehow. They're my, so it's, you know, women, like children, whatever. And so there's something about the, maybe the, the psychogeography of that blobby mediation thing that I don't really know, except that somebody should write a history of it, right? Uh, because it, it's like not, a, when does that fear start, oh, right? In those, you. or I, I guess, <laughs> because I, I'm, I'm ostensibly writing that history I, right so, now. That's so exciting. Uh, yeah, tell us, well, take us just, to church. Uh, no, I can't do that. Um, well, just to, to say, the notion of medium, right, does go back 
to yeah. 17th, 18th century at least, mm -hmm. I think one of the things about John Durham Peters' work that's really interesting is that by talking about elemental me media and the ether, the original medium, yeah, right. right, he's really yeah. connecting them. But yeah. he's, that, the idea of media as, a, as mass media, as media of mass communications, mm -hmm. really doesn't emerge until the, until the 20th century and is mm -hmm. certainly not vernacular until the middle of the 20th century, yeah. but it is like, arrives blobby. Right. It had, there's there's a there's a, a conference in 1959 in Tamament at the in the Poconos. Um, I've invited a ton of basically the most public of public intellectuals, um, only because it's 1959 is Marshall McLuhan not there, right? Um, but at, midway through the conference, in the in the notes which are um, at Bobst, um you know, James Baldwin, who's, who's there, raises his hand and says, I have no idea what we mean by media anymore, you know, halfway through, their, <laughs> mm -hmm. through the proceedings. Now, that is, if any of us are, you know, we're all somewhat in media studies programs, mm -hmm. in any curricular meeting or introduction to media studies course, we all have encountered that still, right? This is in 1959, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but the, I have no idea what media means. Maybe it's yeah. evacuated of all meaning because it means everything. Um, you know, we're, we're still there to a certain extent, and part of my work is to sort of disentangle or um, disambiguate this media concept by looking specifically at when it became professional jargon and then vernacular mm -hmm. across different media industries. So like when in uh, curatorial practices did the idea of an artistic medium replace the idea of individual arts, and how did that relate to the spread of the media concept mm -hmm. within the larger culture? So. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would push back on that. Yeah, I would please. push back on that a little bit in terms of, of your, your time frame because, I mean, so for example, in, in, the, in, the, in the late 19th century, um, there were people writing with great uh, concern about uh, the impact of uh, people reading all these newspapers. Right. Um, and of course, the most famous book uh, by the American psychologist George Beard called American Nervousness. Uh, which was all about, about and he, and yeah, he, he coined the term neurasthenia, right? And the, the idea that, that America, you know, Americans are reading too many newspapers, they're, they're too caught up in the news of the day, and it's affecting their nervous system, and it's causing neurasthenic uh, 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 symptoms, particularly in women. Um, and, and so there's a great, you know, there were some people talking about this, you know, before the 50s, um, in terms of the, the downside, right? Totally, of this, totally. Of this I mean, I, the, that's all I'm No, 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 100%. What <laughs> I'm interested in is it's precisely when a, a concept is required to sort of fill the rhetorical gap of whatever this anxiety is about this thing. Okay. Once you have a concept to describe it, yeah. Um, yeah. What, what, is that, what does that concept reinforce? What does that concept actually elide? Because we all kind of think we know what we mean when we're talking about media. Um, when can you get credited for being someone who thinks about that concept? Like, totally. Right? Well, and this is the origins of my, my, my research is mm -hmm. I went to grad school to study English literature and film. And when I got there, I said, actually, you're not in the film program. You're in the film and media studies program. Yeah, right. Now, that happened actually kind of late where I went to grad school, but around the same time, the uh, Society for Cinema Studies became the Society for Cinema and Media Studies. 2002? Eight, I thought. Well, okay. Well, whatever. Okay. Um, but. Um, and when asked, when we are forced to have these, and you know, they're sometimes really exhilarating conversations about what does that mean? What's the, what curricular changes have to happen? Mm -hmm. Do we have new hires? I guess that doesn't sound that interesting when I put it in those terms. But um, one professor was candid enough and cynical enough to say, like, well, I just think you're more likely to get a job if it says media on your degree. Um, so that is, you know, speaking of ideological effects, that is, is fascinating to me and, and allowed me to kind of reverse engineer this project of when does, when does media become something with sort of um, professional credentialed value mm -hmm. and then when does it become a sort of popular concept yeah, that, that, and a, what's the relationship between those two processes? difference. Yeah. Um, when does it start having um, professional credence or what yeah. have you? Um, but listening to Erica talk about um, Pitkin, is that her name? Um, critiquing a rent for having a blobby notion of something. I did a project where I was trying to trace the moment where mm, talk about mediums, um, air as a medium of sound, et cetera, 
hooked up with a notion of communication in our modern sense as communication across distance. And interestingly, almost all the earliest examples I found were about the spread of plague, mm -hmm. uh, that y you communicate the plague by breathing on someone, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it seems like a sort of tertiary stage in this history you're yeah. tracing, Anna, <laughs> so. has yeah. to do with when media or mediums hook up with the notion of communication across distance. So there's something oh. even more contagious in there, right? It's like, um, the, the other mediums on the table are spiritual inter, right, yes. intercessors, yeah. right, yes. who yeah. have, a, have a different a nature than the empty channel. They can do stuff to you. And yes. so there's something spooky, yeah. right? Like spooky action at a distance feelings. Exactly. You know? yeah. But I guess and this is such a McLuhanite impulse to sort of formalize something about these various mediums. And uh, uh, that's not unproductive by any means. I mean, there's definitely something about virality, mm -hmm. communication across a distance, the uh, opening up of distance in order to collapse it as being something sort of fundamental to mm -hmm. media um, or to a medium. But there's also, I think, something important about when these various other terms that otherwise are supercharged and uh, load-bearing, like culture mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. yeah and propaganda and the press become subsumed under the category of media. Yeah, and that is a yeah. particular historical inflection point that really interests me because yeah. it's not exactly that there is a single technological innovation nor a, a, a particular change in mode of production, but there's some kind of structure of feeling, something that requires yeah. this new concept to be really, to, to you know, proliferate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think on that uh, viral note, we should probably open it up for yes. some questions. Great. How much is it the case that the media influences people, or people influence the media? Uh, some people claim that the uh, great uh, increase in, in income and inequality has uh, been caused of rise of populist movement, and while people want to mm -hmm. read and hear to confirm how they're feeling, so which way does it go? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. I mean, I'll say one thing I was just thinking that I think coincides with this is that the reason what is the media is such a familiar refrain, is that we tend to oscillate between thinking of it as a form of literacy, something that mm -hmm. you, know, you want kids to have media literacy to be able mm -hmm. to read and to access information, or is it a form of like um, mass manipulation where we're being sort of controlled in some ways where the information is occurs to or, or is given to us through certain channels and under certain conditions, and it's, probably both in some way, right? We have media that allow us to get um, information about the world and our place in it. And at the same time, we, have, we exist in siloed spaces where we can subscribe to certain views that will reinforce what we believe. And, we're on, and those are always, I think, offset by the, or amplified maybe, it may be by the, the oral communities that we're a part of that are, in the end, probably just as much, if not more powerful two than forward. whatever media yeah, event I was, we're... I, I mean, I, I, one way to think about this, again, historically, is that if I think about, if I want to think about a, a, an era or a moment, historical moment, in, at least in, in U.S. history, where there was a tremendous amount of anxiety and questioning about new media, I would look at the 1920s. Mm -hmm. Because in just a few years after World War I, think about this, imagine yourself being an adult and then all of a sudden, within a few years, yeah. Hollywood film, radio broadcasting, tabloid newspapers, the phonograph industry, all of the, and of course the, the explosion of marketing and advertising in the 20s, mm -hmm. all these things happen within a few years. And in World War II. Huh? In World War II. In World War II. Yeah. Well, I'm talking about just the media environment. I'm saying that, 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 that the, 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 the proliferation, explosion really, of these new media forms in a very, very tight, window of a few years must have had a huge impact on people 
Uh, I mean, you could throw other things in there, too, like the automobile, for example. But just in terms of, of media forms, as we're discussing them, the 20s, and it's, in my view, no accident that, that there's also, the 20s is also a period of a tremendous um, political reaction, conservatism, immigration restriction, the KKK, the rise of, of, uh, of um, fundamentalism, uh, prohibition. Uh, all these things, it seems to me, and, you know, Republicans dominating the White House and the Congress, it seems to me that that might be a connection there. That is to say that when there are all these new media forms, a, a real shift in the culture, that for a lot of people, um, they want to hold on to what they know and that they become more conservative and that, that it's, you know, it's something that, that, that's frightening to people. Uh, I'm not saying the same thing is happening today, although I do think there are some interesting parallels there. One big hedge fund investor says that when everything quality has gotten this bad, things never end well. He goes back to history. Uh, mm. Yeah. I was having like just this argument with someone this morning on text. It was very productive, right? Where we, you know, where it's like, is is there a need to constant put so much effort into thinking about how to manage media, given? that always seems to mask exactly the conversation of what are the confirmatory conditions of the real mm -hmm. that seem mm -hmm. to validate the repetitions that you're getting from a certain set of players. And mm -hmm. that feels like it forces us out of linear causality. Mm -hmm. And that seems extremely exciting for something that people who are committed to the humanities could champion as a reason why we affirmatively really need to be at the forefront of thinking with mm -hmm. not just science tech, but like, yeah. what is it to read the world at that level of yeah. interconnectedness in a kind of nonlinear way mm -hmm. that gives a more robust account for how we're going to do this kind of ideally long global present in a pluralistic fashion, mm -hmm. right? And I, that seems like that we need like a thousand books just opening up that question in some new way with new language. Yeah. I want to go back to something Anna did and also to a play I saw last night. Um, I'm a Jungian analyst. And when, I think his name is Kevin Roos. He was yes. a New York Times yeah. reporter, and he follows what's going on behind the scenes in Silicon Valley and the tech world. So I think when he was asking, what's Jung's theory of the shadow or definition of the mm -hmm. shadow, he was talking about the field. What's the shadow of the field? Mm -hmm. But the, the associative line of the the uh, computer, was it a computer with the program, mm -hmm. was personal shadow. Right. And so he immediately came out and said, you want to see shadow? I'll show you shadow. <laughs> Divorce your wife and marry me. <laughs> but so that's very amusing. So he was looking for the institutional shadow. Right. And then what happened there. Mm -hmm. Right. But last night I saw Corruption, which is at the Lincoln Center Theater. And it's the story of the Murdoch, Rebecca Brooks, James Murdoch, yeah. the government, the police, uh, conspiracy really in England about what happened with the hacking of people's phones, <coughs> going and their personal lives and mm -hmm. going after and destroying mm -hmm. human beings in the name of circulation. And it's beautifully produced with all kinds of media in it. Mm -hmm. So if you want to see the shadow side and the weaponization mm -hmm. of the media, I think that's just mm -hmm. an incredible mm -hmm. reminder of what could happen, mm -hmm. which we need reminding of, obviously, because we're faced with it every day. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think we should all see it. It sounds interesting. Just to quickly say that um, that conflation that the, the chatbot did between the sort of in institutional infrastructural shadow and the um, interpersonal, I don't know, shadow of desire or something, right, um, has also kind of always been there with the media concept too and this notion of, of um, in that conference I was talking about, um, from 1959, it was republished in book form, and there's this very strange image mm -hmm. on the cover mm -hmm. um, that has a big sort of symbol of masculinity that mm -hmm. uh, that I think maybe stands in for like media man or the kind of um, 
man in the gray flannel suit, the mass man, this is sort of subject who's been drained of all agency. And then, but weirdly, there's like all of these other gender si symbols for, you know, women, woman and man in, 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 in the middle. And I think there's always weirdly a kind of gendered anxiety about, about um, sort of media running, running away with itself. Mm -hmm. um, that there may be the, the controlling the means of production and reproduction in this sort of technical infrastructural way is always going to be the shadow side of that is always going to be about controlling the means of reproduction of the race in some way. Mm -hmm. Well, I know I'm not, I'm not in the mic, but I can hear you. <laughs> there's a whole other thing going on, which is that in the tech world, they're talking about the end of the human species to the digital species. Right. And there's also a very strange talk about shadow link between the misuse of psychedelics right. and the whole Silicon Valley mm -hmm. relationship to that world. So I think that's something that really could be something that For sure. Yeah. I mean, this may be the question of the moment, but I'm wondering also about everything that you've talked about and thought about in terms of, you know, again, the generative AI or the new technology. I mean, to me, it seems like suddenly in the past, you know, few months, we're seeing that we're on the precipice of certain technology that suddenly may have been in a lab and now it's released and it's being implemented mm -hmm. in some way. And I think one thing that's interesting to me as well is that in the past, when I was a child, I kind of thought of the media as being controlled in a way. Like people would say, mm -hmm. oh, these negative messages really play. Let's, you know, put out, you know, pictures of war and, you know, protests and civil rights and all these different things were happening. Um, I'm thinking that with Gen AI, you could even have unintentional things that come out. Like it may, not that it has its own mind yet, but that it may be doing things or generating things that are not true or that are manipulations based on formulaic um, predictions like that people react to these things in a certain way and we'll just keep focusing on those. Anyway, I guess my question is, you know, do you see certain things that are probably likely patterns to happen or needs of controls that might happen in this mm -hmm. new paradigm? Mm -hmm. Well, as long as NVIDIA's stock keeps skyrocketing, uh, I think you probably <laughs> will. <laughs> I, for one, have no idea what algorithm they're referring to. And they show me what they show me. I mean, some of them I get, but others, it's pretty mysterious. You, you, it almost makes it seem sinister. Like, how did you come up? Or random, but sinister and random. Well, I always love that feeling of, like, alienated digital labor or something. Like, I'm sure I, I did something to generate that I'm, you know, that I'm seeing this, but I feel a kind of estrangement from that. This doesn't, I shouldn't be seeing this. This isn't what I want to see. So at some level, there's this estrangement from. Yeah. Or is that my unconscious or. Right. There's always that. There's always better. that. That's always so, that. Well, that's the, anxiety over that. That's the, I, re, I have, you know, I, I taught English in China for a while and I remember talking to some older people who said, you know, the state media, you could read between the lines. You always knew what yeah. actually happened. Yeah. You know, yeah. we saw the state version, we read it. We knew what was really going on. But it's gotten to a point where the complexity is so dense that we don't know if we've done it ourselves. Have I generated this image to appear mm -hmm. on my phone? Or is it, <laughs> is it coming from some other you know, entity, some agency? Mm -hmm. Is it unintentionally, algorithmically generated by AI? There's all kinds of ways in which it becomes increasingly difficult to draw that distinction between you know, the light and the shadow. But that's going back to, I'll just go back to something that Dan said about the kinds of historical continuity that I think are just really important to continue to be drawing at all times is that, um, you know, the kind of, I, I don't really want to see this, but someone thinks I want to see this, like, that's also advertising. So sure. there's a, this is a very, the scale is very different. The, the mode of address is sort of addressed to you as you as you have been, right? As opposed to you as a kind of demographic. We have demography really rebranded mm. as subjectivity here, but it is a rebrand. It's still advertising, you know? And so I think thinking about it in those terms can actually be useful just to like slow the heart rate. Yeah. Um, but also um, in terms of understanding how to read it, how to perceive it, 
um, and how to understand it as, dare I say, yeah, that's, ideological. That's clarifying. That is. I mean, sorry, go ahead. there's a moment in a Shakespeare play where he depicts uh, two lower class characters and one of them, uh, there's a ballad seller who's handing them a ballad and one says to the other, do you really believe that, you know, that there's a woman with the head of a pig or something? And the other says, of course, it's in print. Everything right. in print is true. And so for Shakespeare mocking that notion uh, so long ago, it suggests that we're simultaneously aware. But note that he puts that silliness in the mouths of the two lower class characters, the marginalized characters. I think we all have a sense of somehow we can manipulate things, we can understand, but the flip side of that is what access to new media, whether your new media is writing or print or a cell phone or what, has done for marginalized groups and, you know, women and mm -hmm. uh, the just, we haven't talked about the, the optimistic aspects yeah. at all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I love this Shakespeare line. Side. It's it's perfect because it it gives us that um, overhearing third party quality, right? Yeah. Like anyone can say the lines in someone's mouth, and that's rhetorical. Yeah. But everybody gets the joke, right? It's, everybody it's, gets and the that joke. everybody yeah. that gets it is the people, right? Yeah. Po some populousness and. It sort of brings us to a mode of critique for the kind of generative AI moment. It's like, yeah. wait, this isn't about the dialogic relationship between two beings, but this kind of circulatory everybody knows and doesn't know that is like ineluctably generative, exactly. right? And that's yeah. the potency that is being precisely kind of hidden in a shell game that like that's the stuff, you yeah. know? And I yeah. think the city's so rich in that way. Yeah, I would like to, to thank you for this like great and exciting like random walk down the um, you know, the historical, the philosophical, you know, and the phenomenological aspect of media. But, um, you know, I'm feeling a little bit that we don't have a direction towards kind of like the normative and kind of like the policy aspect. I mean, mm -hmm. I thought that the First Amendment, like, uh, we would have solved everything. But uh, apparently that's, uh, that's not the case. And I want to bring forth like two main like legal cases which refer to media. One is about net neutrality mm -hmm. and the other is the, the recent lawsuit of the New York State or the New York City, I think the, the New York State against the, the big five social media uh, platforms for uh, basically uh, predating, you know, uh, the, their predatory uh, assault on children and creating all these like behavioral and psychological you know disorders and I want your opinion on w what would you prescribe if you were a judge in that case would you side with the children would you side with the with the with, with the right of the, med the social media uh, companies to perform as the way they, uh, they wish, and how we can countervail mm -hmm. any negative uh, after effects, who's gonna pay for the negative uh, after effects, and also the, the issue about uh, net neutrality and, and free speech. Uh, because we can have free speech, but then if, you, if one side can dominate or can, can control what goes out into the media, then we don't really have uh, free speech. So I would like your opinions on these two aspects. Thank you. Those are great questions. Dan, we're looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm reminded of the great <clears throat> press critic, A.J. Liebling, who famously said that, you know, <clears throat> freedom of the press belongs only to those who own one. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 you know, the, 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 part of my response to what you're talking about is this, that, uh, I would like to see a revival of the great sort of anti-monopoly tradition in American politics and culture, which is largely faded. In other words, if you look at American history, really since the early 19th century and the rise of corporations, mm -hmm. you will find a powerful tradition that questions, um, you know, the power and the right um, of these corporations to control things. Mm -hmm. And these kinds of legal battles that you're talking about do have certain, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, pr uh, you know, precedents. Uh, whether it was battles against Western Union, the Associated Press for their monopoly of the news, um, whether it was the attempt to break up the Hollywood studios in the 1940s, okay. 
uh, whether it was the battles over how to best regulate broadcasting, um, th th there, there are antecedents to these things. Um, again, the media are different, and one might argue that the threat posed by the internet or cell phones and so on is greater. I, I, I'm not sure I, where I am on that. But um, it's just a way of saying that, that these things don't, didn't just come up today, recently, that there's a history of this stuff. Um, but I think that, that one of the, the um, unfortunate things in American political culture these days is the decline, almost the evaporation, of the very powerful, very important anti-monopoly, anti-corporate uh, mm -hmm. politics. Well, yeah. um, so that's not really much of an answer to your question. No, I think, it's, I think it's a great answer to his question. Okay. I'm going to double Go down ahead. on it. Sure. Um, which is why, I mean, I made some offhanded comment about how the only person I have any faith in is Lena Khan, the FTC chair, and, and her work sort of... Um, redefining uh, anti-monopoly anti uh, law or reinterpreting anti-monopoly law, not in terms of consumer protection, but actually in terms of um, the sort of distribution of, of power across many yeah. different corporations and not consolidated in the hands of a few is, I think, a really encouraging path forward in terms of trying to um, actually ultimately protect not just consumers, but all of, you know, not, not just us as consumers, but us as humans People, with yeah. agency, with privacy, right? These are our biggest concerns about media effects today. Mm -hmm. The thing that really concerns me about these, this other tact of protecting us from social media, these laws that are not just in New York, they started in Utah, um, and they are now are in, I don't know, more than half of, 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 um, of U.S. state courts is that they're all done on behalf of children. Um, and they all are looking at I isolating particular pernicious effects of particular yeah. apps. And so that, that ends up being some, leading <clears throat> us to some really strange questions like what are the addictive features of Instagram? And how to isolate those to, to me seems like a really foolhardy task. Yeah. It also seems to me to be really, um, ideologically fraught to say we're doing this on, to protect children in particular um, when uh, I think that there's reason to, to think that like, first of all, all of us, even <laughs> those of us who are not invested in sort of reproductive futurity or whatever, all of us deserve protections uh, from the pow these powers of these few, um, these few media corporations. And I generally don't think that sort of um, paternalism is a place to put a lot of our sort of optimism mm -hmm. politically. Um, hello, I'm a, the assistant librarian here at the Institute, and I, I just have a question because I hear a lot of these lectures all the time, and I just have to say that I don't know how you can talk about the effects of media without talking about race mm -hmm. in an entire mm -hmm. lecture. I don't know how you mm -hmm. can do it but you have successfully done it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I do say that because the power of media, and whether it's literal, whether it's visual, is something that you simply have not given enough weight to with regard to race. Uh, my grandfather was in the 82nd Regiment in World War II, and he went to Milan. And so he's marching down the street uh, on his way to protect Mussolini and his girlfriend, um, Patachi, who were hanging in the square. And kids were running behind him, lifting up his jacket, trying to find his tail, because they had saw the film, The Birth of a Nation. Mm -hmm. So if you don't understand the power of media, then I really don't know where you've been. Um, and if we're going to just talk about that or moving forward to men spitting on kids going into school in Arkansas in the 1960s, I mean, I can go on and on, but mm -hmm. I don't know, or, or whether it's Rodney King being surrounded by these men with billy clubs beating him, whether or not whatever he did prior or post. So hopefully at some point, you're going to get to the point where you can give the weight to race that it deserves mm -hmm. with respect to American culture because mm -hmm. there is no culture without mm -hmm. ADOS culture mm -hmm. in terms of American descendants of African slaves. Mm -hmm. But hopefully at some point you'll get there. But mm -hmm. the weight of race has to be accounted for if you're going mm -hmm. to talk about the effect of media. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I would just say briefly that I appreciate that, that, that institutional racism has been a uh, feature of American media, all media, from the very get-go. Well, I'm just talking about this discussion. Oh, this discussion. Okay. Well, I, I, I didn't <laughs> specifically talk about race. It's true. Um, but the use, of, the use of media for exploitation, domination, including racial domination, is, is very clearly a, a big part of the story. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, there, I wouldn't know that okay. if I were to listen to this lecture. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would come away with it thinking that you simply just don't care mm -hmm. or that it doesn't matter. And that's, you know what, though? That's your right. You have every right to talk about whatever you wish. But I'm a citizen, so I'm going to tell you what's important to me and what's important, what should be important to you. Mm -hmm. And it should have enormous weight. Mm -hmm. yeah. Enormous but weight if you're talking about media. If, even if you want to talk about the 60s and 70s in terms of black exploitation film, mm -hmm. in terms of seeing a man of African descent in sensual situations with his shirt off, right? having uh, uh, relations with another woman, whether she be a woman of African descent or a woman of European descent, which was never seen before. Mm -hmm. So the weight of media is so heavy with regard to race mm -hmm. and people of African descent in the United States of America, as well as the world. Mm -hmm. um, and so some improvement is certainly needed. So I think that's a great question. And one of the things I love about it is that it pulls us into the question of who's at, who's at what concentric ring of the conversation, mm -hmm. right? So as a Latina and a first generation, whatever, like it's, it's implicit in the rhetorical position from one perspective that you go into media to say certain things without having to always be marked, right? From the position of the public librarian at the New York Psychoanalytic Institute, I bet you have thoughts about institutionally what, what one would want marked or not marked in a space like this, or the city, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, it's an inescapable question, right? I don't think, um, right, I, I think it's think always, it's always the, the, how would I put this? There's no way you would know f unless you read all of our work, right? What, where we come from. There's no way, right? And so all you can know is what's in the conversation. And I think the question might be something like, how do we shift the many concentric rings of what's happening so that all of those kind of mediations, right, can become central as ideological mm -hmm. aspects of what is being seen and not seen mm -hmm. in every scene, right? Mm -hmm. And if we just do the conversation like in a closed room, if you're not here, mm -hmm. It's, it's possible that the voices that we come from never make it, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So what are we going to do to the frame to guarantee that that isn't re like repeated? Well, right? I think that's Because I can't hold it going myself. To you're going to have to answer that internally yourself. I can't do that work for you. You are um, doing it, though, right, so, for us. Well, but it also depends on what you value. So if you value it, if it has value to you, then you're going to talk about it. But if you're afraid of it or if you really don't care, then you're not. It's well, go simple. the other way, it's, right? It's not really hard. You could say, I value it so much, I don't want it on display at all times. It's my license to speak, coming from a position like that, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't always want to use the biographical currency to use Ebony Coletti's language about this problem to have to validate the fact that, like, I want that seat at the table sometimes to have the talk about something that sounds mm -hmm. awfully abstract but grounds precisely in this question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it always, it, it has validation. It just needs to be discussed. So it has, it has weight and it has value. Mm -hmm. It just depends upon whether the individuals who are talking about it want to acknowledge that value. Yeah, excellent. I mean, I think in that context, it's worth noting that there, there's quite a lot of really good uh, media studies um, discourse on, on race and racism. So that's worth, it's worth looking into as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Should we just put out some names? Like Armin Towns as yeah, yeah, what I was going to say, say on Black Media Nakamura. Studies. Um, Kelly Moore. Yeah. I mean, whole histories of the way in which, for example, the Kodak um, Film Company specifically tailored its chemicals to make light skin appear vibrant and beautiful and dark skin to appear less so. I mean, it's just like a, a reality of like media history that there's, mm -hmm. it's deeply interwoven with racial history. So. Um, but I think, I think we're about done. So thank you so much for all of your participation and for everyone for listening in. Thank you. Okay, then.